Tonight we are continuing in the book of Daniel, and uh, it's like repeat. <laughs> God is, is so amazing, but we see something in this particular story that's coming up that it's like there is an end to his patience. There is an end. And I just find it really interesting. But he has repeated himself. Chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and now chapter 5. Hey, I'm here, and I'm in charge. So, handwriting on the wall. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Like, you're at a party. Like, you're partying. <laughs> You've already imbibed. <laughs> and you see this hand. Well, <laughs> King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that were taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives, concubines, drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. You remember all of those in a statue? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched, watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar it became even more terrified and his face grew even more pale. His nobles were baffled. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he, found, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belshazzar, was found to have... Sorry... Yes, thank you. <laughs> Belshazzar. Belshazzar. Okay, you say it ten times. Was found to have a keen mind and knowledge of understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel and he will be able to tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father, the king, brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, outstanding wisdom. 
the wise men enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means. But they could not explain it. Now, I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Your majesty, the most high God, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar's sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and the peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was disposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from the people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, ate, no, sorry, drank wine from them. <laughs> Must have been chunky wine. <laughs> you praise the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This inscription that was written, Mini, Mini, Tikal, Parzin. Here is what those words mean. Mini, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tikal, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And Parzin, per your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Well, wow. so... Once again, you know, we see um, this whole book unfolding, speaking of who God is. We see uh, Daniel, you know, refusing to defile himself in chapter 1. We see the first dream uh, as well that Nebuchadnezzar had, and, and Daniel interprets it. We see in chapter 3, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, facing the fire. We see the second dream Nebuchadnezzar has, you know, uh, that the Most High rules the kingdom of men. And we see that recounted in this story. And it was only 20 years since the death of Nebuchadnezzar. So it should have been fresh in mind, but it wasn't. So here we see the handwriting on the wall. You know, the Old Testament is full of examples to us that we're meant to be encouraged, meant to have uh, understanding with. The whole purpose 
of the Word is so that we would understand who God is. And that's the, that's the real danger of actually ignoring your Word. And not knowing what's in the Bible. Uh, not going to the Bible to seek wisdom. Is that God has already given it to us. And when we choose to ignore what God has given, or shown, or demonstrated, we can actually put ourselves in danger as we see in this particular story. So Belshazzar, he was the king. Uh, time was about 539 B.C. Bear with me, it's a little bit of history. Okay, remember B.C. is like when the numbers get less, it's a later date, okay? So, and I know that's always confusing. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had died in 562, so roughly 22 23 years have passed. He was succeeded by his son, get the name of his son, Evil Merodach. Uh, I mean, you know, that, yeah, that doesn't sound good, right? Uh, after two years, he was assassinated by Nigerosar, his brother in law. <laughs> his brother in law. We'll just say his brother in law did him in. Yeah, yeah. You got to watch out for your brother-in-laws. <laughs> and his, that brother-in-law, won't try his name again, <laughs> died four years later, leaving the throne to his infant son, uh, Labashi Marduk. Now, it's not always a good thing when there's an infant on the throne, right? Well... <laughs> He was soon disposed of and deposed from the, and there was basically a revolution and the local priests, religious priests, took over. It was a priestly re re revolution. Um, ne Nebonidus, a former priest under Nebuchadnezzar, was made king in 556 BC. We're almost through this. Don't, don't let me lose you. He was appointed his son, Belshazzar, as the ruler of Babylon in his place. In other words, he took over, but he really didn't want to deal with the day-to-day -day stuff, so he gave it to his son to deal with the day-to-day -day stuff. All right? So this, he was basically second in command. All right? So this is why he could only offer Daniel third place. Or it would have been second place. Because he was reigning basically with you know, his, his father uh, at this time. Even though he didn't have this active you know, role. So that's... Now, Nebuchadnezzar here is called father. Um, it really is debatable whether it was a genetic fathering or whether it was in the, used in the same manner as the fathers of confederation. All right? Now, the fa these fathers basically, did, they, didn't, they were part, but they were in the line of ruling. So the liberals would be able to say that, yes, you know, our father, John, sorry, McDonald, Sir, Sir John A. McDonald, okay, <laughs> was, is the liberals' father, okay? So it's the same way that it's being used in this, in this passage. Um, Right, okay, that's what I just, basically it's being used figuratively. So, this wonderful young man decides he's going to have a party. He's going to impress everybody. He is going to make sure that all of the important people are there, and that he's going to throw this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful party that's going on. And how many, everybody loves a feast. Everybody loves to get together and party, right? 
and everything was going fine until he does something really, really dumb. How many know that when you've actually started doing a bunch of drinking and stuff, you can start doing dumb things? Yeah, I've, I've experienced that. I'm sure that some of you have as well. And it's a sad thing, but he goes and remembers about these goblets, these drinking vessels that were used in the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had been brought over. And he's basically celebrating the fact that Babylon has conquered Judah. That Judah's gods are nothing. And so they get these goblets out. They start drinking. Everybody starts drinking from them. I, I, I kind of giggle a little bit at, you know, the list. You know, the list included his wives and his concubines. I mean, this was a party. <laughs> Everybody who was anybody uh, was there. Now, it's kind of interesting because I scratched my head a little bit about the queen. So I, I'm, I don't really... That, now, that queen would have been not his queen... But his father's queen. Okay? Remember, he's second in command here. So there's a king above him and a queen. So she comes in and she really, you know, ends up disrupting the whole party. But she's not there. She's not partying with these guys. Whether she uh, goes to bed early. <laughs> Uh, I have no idea, but she's not there initially. So that's just an important thing to remember. So, you know, they start praising gold and silver and, you know, all of the created things. One of the things that really, if you read the book of Romans, one of the things that God gets upset with is the fact that when we leave knowledge of him behind and start worshiping creation instead of the creator. And God gets upset with that. And this is what we're seeing in this whole story, is the fact that God has basically said, look, I'm the creator of all this. What are you doing worshiping and praising these goblets. So the hand appears. <laughs> I mean, this would be a great Halloween thing, right? <laughs> I mean, if only we could enact it <laughs> outside on the walls or something, you know? Like, but here God comes in. And he's not content just to have words form on the, on the wall. He literally has him see a giant hand writing on that wall. Well, how are you going to respond? Have you ever been caught yeah. Have you ever been caught doing something wrong? My cousin and I, I was visiting my cousin. We weren't that old. I was probably eight, nine. And there was, a, there was a mall close to his place. I was, you know, I, I wasn't, didn't live around any of that kind of stuff. But we went over to this mall. And he said, let me show you something. So we go into the store, and how many like chocolate? Oh yeah, yeah. Chocolate's a great thing, isn't it? Well, chocolate is just, yeah, 
So, here, slide it into your pocket. So we do this. Of course, you know, kids don't think, you know, they got great big bulging pockets, and, you know, and they're walking through looking guilty, right? So I got caught. And, uh, but the feeling of guilt, the moment you know you've been caught, is overwhelming. And you know you've done something wrong. Even before you know the consequences. You know it. And it just impacts you in such a way. I don't know what, God's built us that way, right? Because this is a common experience of humanity. That feeling of, oh, I've been caught doing that wrong thing. And so we see this really unfold, you know, uh, in the king's palace here, where this hand comes and dynamically puts a downer on the entire party. You know, the music gets shut off, the musicians are sitting there dumbfounded, everyone is dumbfounded, and everyone's looking at the wall and looking at the king. And they're all feeling sick. To their stomach because of this being so dynamically opposite to what was just going on. You know, it's amazing. One moment, you know, Belshazzar's uh, heart is all puffed up and, you know, he's going, Woo! Party! You know, like, he was partying hardy. He was just celebrating everything that was Babylon. And then, <laughs> he is just shocked. He's in a moment of shock. This description is what happens when shock hits you. you like, it, it is just, you... you your blood pressure goes crazy, wacky, and you start your physical reaction to this shock stops normal thinking and it stops normal being able to walk, you know, <laughs> bodily functions, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this impacts. And there he is. And you got to remember, he's the king. Like, he's the king. It doesn't describe anybody else. It describes him. Because this thing has impacted him. The writing was on the wall where he was. So he calls his advisors and you know, time and time again, we see the stories throughout one through four. Once again, the, you know, no help. Um, sorry, chief. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty dumb here. <laughs> and, you know, he's going basically, why do I pay you guys? <laughs> right? <laughs> why do I pay you? Why are you here? You know? He, so he calls him, just like Nebuchadnezzar did, and just, you know, so often people um, people look for help in many, many different ways and in many different people. And often those people are in the same rut as the people that they're trying to help. Over the years, I've found that those who, many who work in social work, have wounds in their own hearts. And that they're trying to help other people while still being wounded. And it's great, they've got wonderful compassion, but many times they burn out because what's in their heart hasn't yet been healed. You know, we need to go to the right people in a crisis. We need to go to people who, you know, have wisdom. 
We need to go to the Word of God. We need to go to those who, you know, are, have worked through stuff in life. You know, in today's world, we, we very rarely honor the elder. And it's an unfortunate thing. Because it's not that they're so much wiser than you, but they've been through a lot of stuff and <laughs> come out the other side with a little bit of wisdom. Now, it's just amazing. It's amazing. They go to the wrong place for help. That's exactly what this king did. You know, he was looking to their own strength, their own wisdom, um, or looking to other people. Help me out here. Instead of going to God. Uh, so, the queen shows up and basically says, hey, there's this man. You see, Daniel's reputation was still there. What I still find amazing is that he is still living. He's had a long life. And this is 22 years after King Nebuchadnezzar has died. And he's still in the court. Still there providing administration and wisdom. Somehow, King Belshazzar hasn't met him. And the queen has to tell him. So, number one's queen had to tell number two king about Daniel. So Daniel's brought in. <laughs> and this is the interesting thing. The king really, well, I've, I've heard of you from a distance. You see? It's not the way sometimes it is with Jesus. Everybody's heard the name of Jesus in our society. But they've only heard about him. They don't know him as the one who can be the redeemer and the deliverer. And so we have the same circumstance here with, you know, this king. He says twice, in fact, I've heard of you. Yep, mm-hmm. Heard of you. Yep, uh-huh. I'm not impressed yet. <laughs> right? Because that's the way it is with Jesus. They're not impressed. They don't know what to be impressed about or by. They don't have enough information. They haven't seen enough about him. They haven't yielded to God's promptings within their lives. He only knew him by reputation. He made no effort to get to know Daniel. You know, you think if that you were in a place of authority and you had people that were really wise and stuff, you'd actually make the effort to go and, and meet them. But a lot of times in our own arrogance and also our own, um, I don't need anybody to tell me, we ignore the wisdom around us. And so it was with this king. You know, people do exactly the same thing. God is the last, last thing on their mind. He's the last one they'll go to when it comes to being sick. He's the last one he'll come to when it come, they come to when it comes to being, you know, needing wisdom or needing help or, you know, uh, how do I fix my life? God can do all of those things. And wants to. That's why he's called Redeemer. So the king, of course, says, hey, you know, you can have a gold or a, a purple outfit. Margie would love the purple outfit. <laughs> you can have the purple outfit. You can have the gold chain of, of, that signifies that, you're going, that you are number three in the kingdom. Now, that's a big thing. That's a lot of power, right? 
It's a lot of power. And people would just jump on that. That's why all of his advisors and everything were so dismayed because it would be really nice to be in that position. I'd get the best food. I'd get, you know, so all of those things. But Daniel basically says, you know what, King? None of this really matters to me. Uh, I've already had a great life. God's already put me in a place that's, that's good. I'm comfy. Thank you. Uh, you know, give it away to somebody else. Uh, I'm quite content with that. So, um, Daniel freely tells this king the truth. You see, we ought not to be preaching or ought not to be telling the truth for any other purpose than simply telling the truth. Not looking for reward. Um, crime stoppers, it, it's kind of an interesting concept. You know, tell the truth and get paid for it. And, some, and people call that ratting. See, we've got this really weird concept in our society. But Daniel tells the truth. And first of all, he recounts the whole Nebuchadnezzar thing. You know what Nebuchadnezzar went in chapter 4, which we just went through. And it was only 20 years later. If your um, father, in quotes, um, went through something like this, you would probably know about it, right? You would think. But so it is that, unfortunately, in the kingdom, unless you personally experience, it doesn't matter what your grandpappy went through. It's what we go through. But what our grandpappy went through ought to give us wisdom enough to say, aha, there must be something here in this. Right? It should at least cause us to stop and pause and think. And that's why it's so important to give your testimony to your children and your grandchildren. Because if they don't know your experience, they have no idea why you're a Christian. And so, Nebuchadnezzar's story is told. And he would have learned this. It wasn't that he was ignorant of it. Come on. He was trained. He was schooled. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar wrote the letter. You know, like it was established. It was an established point and, and moment in history. But he didn't learn from that history. He ignored it totally. When we ignore history, we're going to repeat it. We're going to do the dumb thing over and over and over and over again. If you look at, you know, between World War I and World War II, nothing was learned. Absolutely nothing. And if you go back even further through the, out the history of the European wars, nothing was ever learned. <laughs> Got to remember, there was Napoleon, there was all these guys that were running rampage through Europe time and time again. And nothing except destruction and harm. And nobody learned any lessons. Well, here you have God intervening in history with Nebuchadnezzar, and you're ignoring it. But how much do we ignore? You see, once again, this Bible... It's history, but it's a revelation of God. And God revealing Himself. And how, mu how many times do we really ignore Him? To our own peril. And I, and I, and I look at our society today where we get so much uh, of teaching 
uh, what God says wrong, people are saying it's okay and it's right. Standing in direct defiance to God. I find it amazing his patience, his long suffering. And so it was in these first five chapters that long suffering he made with Nebuchadnezzar. You would have thought. So here he is. Belshazzar didn't learn from his father's experiences at all. He exalted himself. This is what Daniel claims. You exalt yourself and not glorifying God. You should have learned this lesson as a kid. Remember? This handwriting on the wall was sent to be able to confront him with the fact of who God is. Who else could take a hand out of thin air and write on a wall? No one. Absolutely no one. You know, they knew the stories. They knew all of the stories. They knew the pride of Pharaoh. You know, they knew all of the, their own Babylonian history. You know, but we can learn as well. All the murmuring and complaining of the Israelites. All of the, um, this isn't, man is not good enough. Uh, we'd like a little meat, you know. <laughs> all of those kind of things are leaders. Absolutely suck. Uh, ground had a lunch that day. <laughs> we need to learn the principles that God has set up for us to be able to live a life that is honoring and glorifying to Him. Making sure that we don't put ourselves in the same place that Belshazzar did in raising himself up. So, the handwriting was explained. Ha. God's numbered your kingdom and finished it. So, there he is, knocking knees, knowing that he's done something wrong, and this is the judgment. Numbered your kingdom and finished it. That's it. That's all. You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. This is judgment. I've set you in this place and yet you've ignored what I've taught your father. You are weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Now, you remember the story? The statue? This is a completing of that whole story that we were given about the divided kingdom and all of these things that was given to King Nebuchadnezzar. So... Belshazzar, bless his heart, gives Daniel the purple robe, the gold chain, and the one-third kingdom. Well, that really lasted a long time, didn't it? <laughs> because that very, very night, he dies. So how quickly and, uh, and the proud and the boastful will fall despite their power and their wealth. You see? Often we who don't necessarily have a whole lot of money think, oh, if I only had more money or more power. 
And you always got to remember, folks, don't be impressed by those things. Underneath the power, the wealth, is a human heart with all the aches and pains and sufferings and wounds that you and I have experienced. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to tell them the truth. Don't be afraid. Now, Herodotus is a uh, historian, a Greek historian. Um, and he indicated that Babylon actually fell as a consequence of diverting the waters of the Euphrates into the city so that they would have water supply. But apparently the enemy entered under the city walls where that water went through and destroyed um, the city. Uh, others think that there was treason or subterfuge and uh, somebody opened the gates. We don't know for certain, but the bottom line is, he died. And the kingdom, Babylon, ended up being divided from that moment on. God had finished dealing with Babylon. And there was a further history that was going to develop. And that's recorded. You start you know, talking about the restoration of Israel and the rebuilding of the temple and all those things as you move along in this history of the exile. But at this time, Babylon has been removed from its place. Remember how lofty it was? How powerful what God actually said about Babylon? And here it is, destroyed, because time after time after time, God had pled with them, honor me, give me glory. And they had consistently turned back and turned away. It's amazing. To me, it's amazing the fact that God was pleading with these pagans, okay? I'm putting it in quotes. Can I say God was pleading with these humans to turn to him? You see, we, we often think, oh, Israel, 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 Israel. And you know God was humans. He was about human beings. The only reason he picked Israel out was in fact to be able to be a light in the entire world, which they never did. But God consistently, you know, through this thing, He ends up showing we have a need for a Messiah because we can never do it on our own. Ever, ever do it on our own. So when we have that feeling of guilt, when we have that feeling of I've disappointed God, I have a Redeemer. I have one who did not disappoint God. I have one in whose shadow I can, I can duck under when I have blown it. And he has redeemed me and set me free as a result of that. But all of this goes to show, like, no matter what, we have a hard time really learning as human beings. And I would say even as Christians, we blow it so often and we may not even know that we've blown it and yet that covering that God has given us for a relationship covers us over. It's an amazing, amazing thing that he has done. But this night, your soul will be required of you. Remember Luke 12 verses 15 through 21, it reads this way. Then he said to them, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, 
You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Sounds like a party. But God said to him, You fool. This very night, your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but it is not, but is not rich towards God. Now get that. No problem with storing things up, right? Okay, I don't want any misconceptions. God's not against rich people, okay? But he wants everyone to be rich towards him. And by the way, you don't have to be the rich person to be storing stuff up for yourself. Right? Yeah. But there is an immediacy that happened in this story in Daniel 5. And so there's an immediacy in this story that Jesus tells as well. And it's basically a warning for all of us. Take care that you're not boasting. That you're not, you know, like somehow satisfied and, 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 and just living for yourself. Because you can be boasting just like Belshazzar was and the next moment, be dead. Live for what's of value. Bring glory and honor to God. And that's what he wants us to learn and understand from this whole thing. So, the announcement of doom and gloom, and you're going to die, you know, the, the party's over permanently, came because the king misused and abused the pieces of metal that belong to God. He was worshiping the pieces of metal that God had created the metal and had that metal formed into an object that was holy, specifically meant for the temple. He was arrogant and it wasn't tempered by history. <laughs> Like, I really wish that some of our leaders would temper their arrogance and their <laughs> whatever it is about them with some of the lessons of history. And have that humility. And I don't just mean the humility of saying sorry. The humility that maybe would keep them from making dumb mistakes in the first place. His arrogance was amazing. He challenged the God of Israel in the action that he did. He challenged God, you know, the God of, of Judah by doing what he did. And God stood up and said, You lose. You lose. God doesn't want us to get to that point. I mean, you got to remember, this is one instance. But look what God has done for Nebuchadnezzar. Was constantly trying to, hey, and to the point where we might even see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. I don't know, but I look at chapter 4 and I see how it ends like that, and I'm going, wow. If he continued to live in that manner, there was a reward awaiting for him after his death. But in this case, Belshazzar, he deliberately knowingly challenged this God. And he died as a result of it. Folks, that's why we pray for mercy for people. When they come and they oppose the gospel. 
when they speak against God. We pray for mercy. God does not want to judge until the breath has been taken out of that person. God wants mercy to exist. He is long-suffering. The whole chapter 13 in Corinthians, that love chapter, it's all about how God interacts with us as human beings. Not remembering the wrong. You know, like, so even though we want to see the strike them dead, Lord, <laughs> kind of reaction, God, during this season, and by the way, he can, because he did, right? But in this season, he has chosen to exercise mercy towards those who do not yet know him, who even shake their fist at him. And thank God for that, or this church wouldn't exist. The man who started this church went through the ice, bounced out, shook his fist at God, and said, You can't get me that easy! If it wasn't for God's mercy. But God's mercy reached out for that man. Redeemed him. Set him on a course for his life where many have been redeemed. And that's God's purpose. It was God's purpose in Nebuchadnezzar's life. Hmm. So Lord... We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you are strong and powerful and mighty. Lord, at a whisper, you could wipe us all out, we know. And yet your mercy and your perseverance with us, your long-suffering with us, Lord, your, your, your gentleness towards us is so amazing. Ha. Huh. It's so, so amazing that you have chosen to love us and redeem us and set us free from our sin and the penalty of our sin is an amazing, amazing thing. And we thank you for that. Help us, Lord. In the middle of our life, in the turmoil, in the interactions with others, to always, always remember your mercy and your long-suffering towards us. And to rejoice in you. And to be thankful towards you. We thank you now, Jesus, for all that you've done in our lives. For all that you did to, to set us free. To redeem us. Your death paying for my sin. It's so amazing. And so I just thank you, Lord. Work in our hearts as only you can. Keep us from being boastful and arrogant, Lord. Help those amongst us, Lord, who are our leaders, Lord, to be humble servants. Bring them to knowledge of who you are. Lord, from our Prime Minister all the way through the Parliament, Lord. Let there be a revival. Let them, let them not only just hear about the works of God, but experience the work of God in their own life. So we thank you. And we praise you. In your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you this night. Thank you for coming out. It... Uh, it's always, always a joy to open up the Word of God. Always a joy to, to examine it. And, you know, it's, it's, it is an exciting thing that this Word, so old, can apply to us now. 
because the human heart and human experience has not changed. God still wants to reveal himself to each one of us. And hopefully not with writing on the wall. <laughs> that might just be a bad thing. <laughs> God bless you and have a great night.